All right, so let me ask you this question before I kind of get into the main presentation. How many of you attended, kind of quick show of hands, the keynote presentation yesterday by Andre on a very similar topic? Okay, so you can think of this session a little bit more as an extension of that talk. And the primary message that I'm hoping to get a chance to share with you is very similar, that we are at a very critical juncture as an industry, as a community, where the rules of the games are about to change. Uh, the types of tools and the technologies available to all of us and the adversaries are about to significantly amplify. And then what we should be thinking about, what we can do today to prepare for that, and what we can do in the future potentially what we can do to prepare. So the idea behind is just to kind of make yourself aware what is coming and why what we have so far potentially may not be enough. My name is Ashish Jain. I'm a chief technology officer for a company called Arcos Labs. We do bot management, fraud detection, and account security. Prior to joining Arcos, I used to work for eBay where I led identity, authentication, uh, trust, and risk and fraud teams. So the charter of my team included all global registration, authentication, account management, KYC, payment account fraud, cancellation disputes, and a number of things. I have been part of this industry for almost 20 years now. I have served multiple terms on the OpenID Foundation Board. So definitely kind of got a chance to kind of grow and evolve with this industry. And if you think about it, the, you know, this community and this group of people started to come together with Liberty Alliance in 2000 timeframe put together a bunch of frameworks around governance, around assurance and, and federation. SAML 2.0, I don't know if you guys remember it. It was February of 2005. It was first ratified. I used to work for Ping Identity in the day. It took a little bit of an effort to actually solve the web SSO problem in a standards fashion. And since then, we have innovated as an industry and collaborated to kind of do OpenID 1.0. You know, with, with OAuth, we, we solved the API access problem. With OpenID Connect, we are able to bring the stack together, solve web SSO, API, mobile SSO into a single protocol. I'm sure you have heard WebAuthn and Passkey enough in this conference. Uh, still not completely there with the adoption, but it's a matter of time. And if you go forward, you know, when you think about verifiable credentials, DID, and, and mobile wallets. So as an industry, we have come a long way. We have built a lot of protocols. We have adopted and deployed a lot of protocols. However, whenever this industry or this community put together some standards, the persona or the audience that we always gear towards is the good user. What can I do to build a protocol or a standard to simplify and make a safer and a delightful experience of a good user? And of course, we do that with a security mindset, but whenever it comes down to the adoption, usability, deployability, and the access is a very, very big deal. What we do not pay enough attention is to a different type of user who is a bad actor, who is also trying to figure out how do I break into the system and the protocol that you just built. And I think this, if you think about it, even this conference has continued to evolve in the last 15 years from primarily the good user for enterprise and a workforce identity into the consumer, but we have not spent enough time to target the persona of a bad user. And the reason I bring that topic is that, similar to how we have built a roadmap and we have evolved as this community, there's a separate set of people in a different industry, in a different conference somewhere, who are also evolving and trying to figure out and build the applications and tools to break the protocols that we build. It started in the late 90s with a simple curl script over a period of time. There are so many open source tools and applications which continue to become more and more sophisticated. And we are to a point that as we evolve, they evolve. And I do not know how many of in the room is anybody from the ID Pro community here or a member. We have done a great job in terms of synthesizing all the knowledge and sharing with this group of people so that we can consolidate the learnings of the last few years. These people, the different type of people in a different conference, have also taken inspiration. And there is a bunch of tutorials and Telegram communities and the YouTube tutorials to able to educate how do you attack the systems that we are all trying to protect and build. We all came together and we said that you know, you know, when you build an identity offering, I need to build a SAML connector for Salesforce, figure out which profile and bindings. I need to build a SAML connector for Workday, Office 365, 
can I use the same endpoint as a SAML IDP, as an OAuth AS, and an issuer for verified credentials? And you know, this is how we innovated in IDAS, and there's a bunch of standard IDAS offerings available, and I'm guessing many of them are using, you, using it. Similarly, the fraudsters kind of came together, and they realized every time I have to attack a website, I kind of have to figure out how to bypass IP reputation, so you know, figure out what kind of proxies I can use for a better IP. I need to do device spoofing so that I can escape the velocity checks that you are putting together. If somebody puts a captcha, I need to you know, evolve or involve the human fraud factor of this, which is low-wage countries, can somebody can solve the capture for me. As we built IDAS, that community kind of got together, and they built something called as the Cybercrime as a Service, which stands for CAS. The two popular ones, which has become more and more you know, prevalent, one of them is called the Genesis Marketplace. It was actually shut down a few months ago by the FBI. And the, the intention behind was that, you know, not just do a credential stuffing attack, but how about I give you a ding device fingerprint? How about I also give you an authenticated cookie? And it's a built-in browser so that you can bypass the velocity checks around device fingerprint, all embedded into a single service. The second very popular service which came to, to fruition late last year was called Evil Proxy. And similar to how we build the connectors for SAML for Salesforce and Workday and Office 365, if you look into that, they built plugins and templates for Dropbox and Google and Microsoft 365. And you can subscribe to them for about 400 bucks a year, a, a month, cancel any time, and you get guaranteed success for what they claim for. So you may not realize it, but there is a definitely a, a, a lot of people, maybe more than this community, who are trying to attack the very systems that we are trying to protect. When you look into the attacks at a very high level, I can put them into two broad categories. The first one is called the volumetric attacks, and the focus of them is around scale. So uh, in, in this case, for instance, if I get 10 million accounts, even if I get 1% one one success rate to compromise them, that is still a lot of accounts. The monetary value per account is still maybe like three to five bucks, but when I operate that at a scale, I'm able to get a lot of ROI into how I attack the systems. The second category of attacks are the low and slow attacks, and they may be targeted either towards the end user or maybe towards the site. And the example of that, for instance, would be the social engineering attacks. For the volumetric attacks, there is a bunch of tools and available, like I mentioned, where you give them a username and a password combo list, they do the hard work for you. They figure out the right policies and escape patterns for the main websites. And if you just do a simple search across what has happened in the last six months, you will see plenty of example how these volumetric attacks have changed the way we do business. North Face, about 200,000 attacks were compromised by simple condition stuffing. The company, it took two weeks to even find out that this attack is happening before they can protect or do anything about it. Eventual result, of course, is that you go up and change the passwords. As you can imagine, that adds a significant amount of friction for the end user to do, go and do that. PayPal, they announced that in their earnings call a few quarters ago that they had 4.5 million fake accounts that were created on the website. And think about it, of all the companies that you deal with, PayPal, you would think would have the right controls and things in place. 4.5 million fake accounts. And the reason why fraudsters create fake accounts, because there are multiple ways they can monetize that at a later time. If you're a gaming company, you can monetize that by scamming or spamming in the in-game uh, community. If you are an e-commerce company, they can monetize that by using the promo abuse. Sometimes you get 5% off or $5 off on your first purchase. So there are a variety of ways the fake accounts can essentially be very helpful. And this is why in a volumetric attack, you see them. The DraftKing use case you may have heard of. This was an 18-year-old person uh, who was able to attack it. The use case, the way he did that was very simple. He got some uh, leaked usernames and passwords. His pattern was that he wrote a script where you deposit $5, uh, then you change the password. Within the same session, you enable 2FA, and then 10 minutes later, you go in and withdraw the complete amount. So whenever you had the policy that look for to be able to withdraw the complete amount, it should be 2FA enabled. Well, he did 2FA enabled before he withdrew the amount. Uh, and you know, as per him, it was pretty fun. If I made that kind of money, if I'm 18, I'm pretty sure I'll find that fun too. 
you may have heard of the Taylor Swift use case, which is that they were trying, the, the Ticketmaster website was down because the moment they released the sale of the tickets, uh, it was, there was 3.5 billion requests within that moment. So it, of course, crashed the website. Uh, and in their defense, before they released the tickets, they did ask the users to create an account. They also asked them to verify the email address. So they did the right things in place to be able to protect. However, the fraudsters were good enough that a month before the attack happened, they did actually make the fake accounts. So the day the tickets were released, they were all ready to be able to use those accounts to put them and try to log in. The social engineering attacks, you may have heard of something called a romance scam, targeted primarily towards the elderly people. And the idea behind this is that, look, you're lonely, you don't know, you know, you need a partner. So over a period of time, I reach out to you, I get close to you, and then talk about what can I do to help with your life savings. Eventually, I make you withdraw that money and give it to me. The second very, very popular scam that you may have heard of is called the grandparent scam. And this goes back to how can I use the voice? I know Andre played a video yesterday, for instance, of his voice. In this case, your grandkid will call you and tell you I'm in trouble because you know, I did something wrong. I you know, ran into somebody in a back alley, and he was a bad guy. They're keeping me hostage. Or maybe I was driving a car. I hit a pregnant woman. They're taking me to jail. Grandma, can you pay $5,000? Don't tell dad because he will get upset because you know, it's his car. Uh, and they do that, and then the voice sounds like the voice of your grandkid. And you know, as a grandparent, in that time, in that moment, you're panicking, and you end up giving that money. And there are plenty of examples that you may have seen that. The other one is called the pick butchering. It's also sometimes connected to the crypto scam, where again, I get close to you. Eventually, I ask you to invest into a crypto fund. And once you have done that, you know, then I basically say the fund disappeared, or there are taxes and fees, and I start with 1,000, 2,000, and eventually get to hundreds of thousands of money I take out from you. The business email scam uh, stands for BES, and you may have heard of them. You get an email or a phone call sometime from the executive. Uh, I need something to happen right away, either buy a gift card or transfer some money. There's a very famous case in which a Toyota supplier agreed to do a wire transfer of 37 million because he got an email that this has to get done today. Otherwise, you lose the contract. So there is a bunch of these attacks which are happening in front of our eyes. Now, all of this is already there, and now enter the generative AI. And the reason why this is that critical point that historically, like I said, there are two types of attacks. The volumetric attacks, they are simple script. They operate at scale. And then you have low and slow attacks, which are sophisticated, customized, take a lot of time, but at the same time, the reward is high. Generative AI allows you to combine these two types of attack into a single motion, because now I can build and generate a script which does not require this human intervention, and hence my cost to be able to build that attack is too low, and I can scale it at a much, much bigger level. If you think about what has happened, and this is only six months old, if you think about it, you know, the, the reason why there are not too many sessions at this conference on this topic, because this, the submission date was January 6th, and by that time, it wasn't really that big a topic. In six months, this is talk of every single discussion I've been part of with our customers. Microsoft, with Wally, -E, has claimed that with three seconds of your, of your voice, I can actually create a voice sample for you. Uh, think about it, three seconds of you know, talk you can get anywhere. If nothing else, you pick up a phone, call the guy, and say, how's the weather? You have your sample, and then you can create the voice to be able to fool anyone. There's a Wall Street Journal journalist who essentially used deepfake to be able to create a clone for, him, for herself, and he was able to fool the bank and do self-verification. I talk about the chatbot, which take a long time. If you, if you are chatting with somebody to build the relationship, to have them trust you, to be able to you know, give your life savings to, to, to you, with the AI-driven chatbots, that concept is, goes away. And just to kind of explain a little bit more of the power of that, I was putting together that for this session in full disclaimer, I use the prompt which says, I want to give a talk at this IND conference. Give me a catchy title. That's the title of this talk. And I use then then say, give me an abstract for this title. 
That is the abstract for this talk. Don't tell Andy, he will reject my submission for next time. I use that abstract to say, give me the examples I can use in this talk. This is the examples that you're seeing. And then I'm gonna show you a little bit more. But my point is that this is becoming more and more intelligent, and this is only six months old. The last picture of is, do not really drive an additional point. I just wanted to see Pope in a puffy jacket. Uh, but the point is that the defect technology is here, it is real, uh, and the only reason why it is not a bigger issue than what it could be is, is A, because of access, because for instance, the volley from Microsoft, it is still not open. Like the large language models that we see today are still primarily text-based, the voice space and image based are still not widely available. Uh, but other than that, the cost factor, which if you look into OpenAI, they spent $1 million per day to run what they have today. So it is definitely expensive. So even when today, if you expose the different models, it will be expensive for fraudsters to be able to use that. However, as I'm sure all of you know, and if history is any indicator, the cost can only go down. There is already, if you go to a website called Hugging Face, which lists a bunch of open source uh, models, there are a lot of smaller models, vertical models, that you can now run on the edge. You can now run on a mobile device. In fact, for this community, I almost would say that we should track it that two years from now, the possibility that you will be using passkey on your device to log in from an adoption standpoint versus you will have a language model running and available on your mobile device, which one has a higher percentage. And I wouldn't be surprised that the availability of the language model completely running on a mobile device has a higher chance of success. I have touched upon a variety of things in this topic. I'm gonna to touch one more thing. Historically, when it comes down to protect against these attacks, we have used CAPTCHAs. And the primary, the premise behind them is that, look, you know, I will detect bot versus robot, uh, a human. And of course, there are ways that you can break it. But historically, the way you break it is that you have a large inventory of images, and you then manually tag them and label them. And then once you have labeled them enough, then essentially you, know, you are able to classify any time you see a new picture or a new image that whether or not this is, is true versus wrong. Now, the challenge with this approach, as you can imagine, is that to be able to tag a large amount of pictures, you have to sometimes depend on human labor. And any time you eventually end up breaking it, that the provider can always change the captcha or the image, and then you have to start over. What happens with generative AI, and I don't know if you have paid attention to the generative adversarial networks, where you can now run two models in parallel. You can run a generative model, which is a very small sample size. I can get to generate a bunch of image. And then I can have a classifier model where I can try to break and decide whether it is generated or real. And I can run them in parallel, and the moment the classifier model starts to beat the generative model, I know I have solved the CAPTCHA. So just think about it for a second that all the protection that you have done against bots with a very small sample size, technically it is possible to be able to beat them just because we have the technology available today. Now, I don't wanna scare you too much. There are, of course, a cat and a mouse game. There are things that you can do to protect against it. You can poison the sample images. You can add noises to the CAPTCHAs so that it makes it harder uh, to be able to uh, classify them or label them. You can have 3D images which are a little bit longer for computer vision to be able to master. But the bottom line is that this is the world we are about to enter. And, and at a minimum, we should be prepared and thinking about it as we go forward. Now, this goes back to kind of how do we protect from this point on. Uh, and I have kind of three initial thoughts, this in by no means completely exclusive. The first one is, just the education and awareness and being prepared. The technology still do not have enough access control. There is definitely not enough guardrail. In fact, this is the first time a tech industry has come together and say we need to pause it, we need to put some more controls into place, we have to slow it down. Generally, we leave that job to the government, but this time the tech industry is raising its hand, it's too much, it is too disruptive, and, and we need to be a little bit more careful about it. So I'm expecting this goes back to this community who has done a great job in putting together the standards and protocols to control and protect the identity of the users to come in and participate in those conversations of how do we do access control and governance around this technology. 
The second point I want to make is that you need to be able to do some basic things, period. You know, sometimes they say, what is the enemy of good? It's being perfect. So do not try to be perfect. I call them kind of no regret activities, which you should do regardless. If you have not invested in stronger authentication, whether you are enterprise-centric company or a consumer-centric company, you should do that now. Now, historically, you may have had an excuse that there are not enough technologies, there is not enough tools. I feel like that excuse does not hold good anymore. I'm sure you have seen plenty of talks across this conference into PASCI, which is a pretty good balance in between security and usability. And if that is not in your roadmap, then it should be in your roadmap. Now, I'm not saying that is the only thing that you should do around stronger authentication, depending upon your customer base, your audience, your maturity of the company. There are other things that you should think about too. Having said that, if you have not done enough to secure your front gate with a better lock of stronger authentication, that should be a higher priority. The second connected part to that topic is that similar to, you know, you have a good lock, but this is a time when you also need to have cameras and sensors outside of your house and inside of your house. And I think that is the concept around passive signals or risk-based signals, and Andre touched upon that a little bit yesterday too. Any time a user, whether it's good or a bad user, access your website, you have plenty of data that you have access to. You have the information about the IP address. It's coming from a data center or a residential proxy. It is coming from a Tor node. It is a VPN. You have bad IP reputation services that you can engage with, but you have a lot of information which gives you a better profile of the session that this user is currently engaged in. The same thing goes for email address. Anytime anybody gives you an email address, in addition to the email verification that you do, which is send you an email, click on that link, which proves the possession of the email, it does not prove the reputation of the email. Whether this email was created two days ago, whether it's from a domain that is a burner domain, whether or not email tumbling was, required, was used, for instance, Google allows the dot into ashish.jn and ashish Jane dot are the same email address. Whether or not enumeration is used, which is you know Ashish one, Ashish two, which tells you that this is a script behind the scene. Same thing goes for phone number, which is that it is a prepaid phone or a postpaid phone. Is it a voice or IP phone? Was this phone number changed recently? You can actually even do a name address match with the phone number without any privacy violations, and there are a bunch of vendors who help you do that. My point is that all of those are passive signals which give you the data to make more intelligent decisions, whether or not to allow access to the systems that you're trying to protect. In addition to this data, you also have data of the device fingerprint data. Many times the fraudsters try to use randomization to bypass your velocity checks. So you get all of that data around the device, which you're able to then again leverage it. You can find repeat good user or a repeat offender by simply depending on this information. You map that data with the behavior data, which is touch and gestures and, and uh, mouse movements. And again, a different signal, completely passive signal, does require some effort on your side. Uh, but the point is all of that are, I relate them to the sensors and cameras that you have to have in the house to be able to protect against uh, these type of attacks. They're all valuable in isolation. They are even more valuable if you're able to triangulate them and put them together and create a more holistic picture. So eventually over a period of time, then you can figure out the right clusters where what kind of devices I have to protect against or have a higher risk of assurance I need. Uh, but in between OS and browser and capture solutions and in between IP and email address and phone numbers, you can start to put together what you call an identity graph within your enterprise, which gives you much better defenses than what you have today. Kind of coming back to the fact that we, as an identity industry, have primarily focused to make life easier for the good user. And I think it's about time that we need to make life a little bit more difficult for the bad user. And there are a different set of tools and technologies that we would need to be able to kind of help against that. I want to thank you all for your time. I hope this, you found this session useful and happy to carry the conversation. If you have any questions, I'm sure there is somebody with the mic. Otherwise, just yell and should be able to answer it. 
Go ahead. So now to scare us, what do we do about it? Uh, come next year, same time for my session, and I'll give you the solution. <laughs> no, I think the point I was trying to say is that, look, at the end of the day, there, there, at least you're aware. Like, would you rather have your eyes closed and hit you, or would you be prepared on your way back home and you're flying that, shit, maybe I should pay a little bit more attention? So at least part of my job was that you should pay a little bit more attention. The second point I want to make is that, this is what I call them, there's some basic hygiene and discipline that you should do. You should do that today. The technology I talk about, passive signals and strong authentication is available today. You should absolutely try to figure out the importance of why should you do that. The challenge is that nobody disagrees we should do it. I've been at eBay, and which, so I can tell you that we never disagreed. The problem is, how do I prioritize it? Because I have 50 other things. What I'm trying to tell you is that because of the attacks that are coming, you should have a higher confidence in saying, I should prioritize them tomorrow. The third part I would say is that this is still very new. I'm not saying, by the way, by any means that if you do this, you will be protected. All I'm saying is that if you do this, you have a better chance of avoiding the attacks. So hopefully that as an industry evolves, as we see more and more type of this, there's a bunch of people like us who are paying attention and are, are more deeply involved. And hopefully that we continue to evolve as an industry to protect it, similar to as the other people are evolving to attack us. Any more questions? Go ahead, sir. <laughs> so, for, like I said, for, the, for both of those attacks, there are a bunch of technologies available. Well, social engineering attacks are harder, and my point to them was that they're going to become, they, you're going to start seeing them at scale, right? So, the best you can do today, you know, is a little bit more education. Like, for instance, think about it this way. Phishing uh, is common, and if any of you work for a big company, I'm sure you have taken the uh, detect the phishing email by your infosec team, and one of the common thing was the language is poor, or there are grammatical mistakes into that one. I'm, that goes away uh, with this. So there's a little bit more education and retooling yourself when it comes down to the low and slow social engineering attacks. When it comes down to the volumetric attacks, there are a bunch of technologies available today when you can do a better bot detection or a fraud detection by utilizing the signals I mentioned earlier. And depending upon your company, you can decide whether you should use one vendor versus multiple, whether you should build organically versus use somebody else. But the bottom line is that that technology to, to use passive signals to create a better session profile to augment your authentication is very, very critical even today. And it becomes significantly far more critical a day after tomorrow. Go ahead. No, I think 100% agree. What you said about baby steps, and you know, the, my point was that I call them no regret moves, that you have to do that, and there is no reason, you have no excuse why you're not doing it. And I think the, the other part you, was a very critical topic you raised. At the end of the day, this is a business. Of course, there are some people who are trying it to get some street cred. So you may find an 18-year-old somewhere trying to get some street cred, get some you know, ego boost. But majority of the attacks that you see are driven by financial motives. So if, if you can't do nothing else, but if you raise the cost so that they have to do a little bit more, this is where, like I said, if you pick up some signals, do some velocity checks on IP, guess what? They cannot use the regular IPs. They have to find the uh, residential IPs, which cost more. So you can find a regular IP, you know, 
in, you can buy them in bulk for $30,000. You can have a, a million of them. The moment you say, I'm going to do a velocity check, I'm going to check the reputation of this, they have to buy more expensive IP. So you're increasing the cost for them. And at the end of the day, this is a business. When they realize it is not giving me the ROI that I was looking for, they're going to go somewhere else. Thank you guys for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference.